here. Okay, so if you can just make sure that your microphones are muted there, that will be sound. Today's webinar is about optimizing recovery. It's commonly from just working with people and the questions I tend to get asked. It's a, it's a poorly understood topic and there's just quite a bit of um, myths that, that people tend to still hold true for, for this topic in particular. So let's let's get into it. Like, I mean, when I say recovery or when you hear the word recovery, what, what does that mean? Like what, recovery in what sense? Like, are we looking at you know, glycogen repletion, so your, your carb store, are we looking at electrolyte restoration, are we talking about fluid replacement, muscle remodeling, repair, oxidative stress buffering, or are we trying to enhance or maybe buffer some of the adaptation you're getting? So recovery is a vague term, it's an umbrella term that encompasses a plethora of things happening inside your body at any given time, and usually people don't think about it like this, they just think, hmm, protein shake. I need to get a protein shake right after recovery. And that's how I, that's how I sort myself out. That's fine. That's, that's the common thing done. And that does cover to a degree muscle remodeling and repair, but it negates glycogen, electrolytes, fluids to a degree. Doesn't really pay any credence to the last two factors here. Some people will be all about carbohydrates. Again, that doesn't factor in electrolytes, fluids, and doesn't even hint at the antioxidant or the anti-inflammatory nature of recovery and maybe how those pathways interplay. So just, I suppose, just before we get into it, when you exercise or when you race, the goal will be a little bit different. So we always have to think for the recovery of an athlete, what's the goal? Is it performance enhancement or adaptation or are we just literally looking to get them get them fresh asap if your goal is adaptation you want to leave some oxidative stress you want to leave some inflammation present that's how you get your recovery stimulus that's what kicks off muscle remodeling protein synthesis that's how you make new tissues you need an inflammatory stimulus to have that happen so for example the difference between recovery on a race day and a training day you probably wouldn't be suggesting that an athlete would have lots of antioxidants or beetroot juice or tart cherry juice anything like that in and around the race or in and around the training session because it cuts off all of that i suppose oxidative stress and, and you, you don't necessarily get that same stimulus from the work you're doing. I hope that makes sense. I feel like I've made a jumble to this already. Basically, one thing we're going to look at, and I'll keep asking the question as you go through the talk, performance or adaptation, very, very different things. And again, like, you know, as, as I said, mostly what people think of when they think of recovery is normal tech boots, which can help a little bit with uh, your you know, blood flow circulation, which will bring more oxygen, more, more fuel in that to muscles, but it's probably not hitting everything or people would think of ice baths, which might actually hamper uh, inflammation, oxidation. So you might actually cut off your stimulus there, or as I said, protein shakes. So there's a little bit more to it than people often are aware of. So let's, let's get into some of the evidence-based things that we might look at when we want an athlete to recover a little bit better. Okay. And again, just to reiterate, adaption or performance. What are we trying to do here? And I had a nice infographic that I stole from a paper. And this, this is all to say, okay, this, this line here is your, your exercise stress. And as we go up and down that y-axis there, this is a degree of inflammation or oxidative stress present, okay? The lesser you have, the lesser of a stimulus you have to recover from. The more you have, the more of a stimulus you have to recover from. So you'll often hear of the term overtraining or overuse injuries. That can sometimes be as a result of poor recovery or getting too much of the stimulus. So you're in a pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidative state, 
tissues break down. You, you, don't, uh, you don't recover in time. It's a little bit complicated, um, but th this is all, again, just to bring it back to performance or adaptation. What is the goal here? Okay, so number one, where does nutrition strategy fit in? Exercise, that gives you your stimulus. Depending on what we do in the recovery, that is either going to give you or it's going to prevent adaptation. And that adaptation, when you, when you sleep, when you, when you rebuild that tissue, when you're deep sleep that night, that, that's when you make those physical changes, those neural changes, those biochemical changes that leads to a superior performance. So it all depends on how, how you eat, how you behave between stimulus and adaptation, okay? Just uh, in the grand scheme of things, what we're talking about here. And these are generally outside of your food, what we're looking at. Sometimes it's timing. Sometimes it could be other medications. Sometimes it could be a bunch of supplements that you are taking, maybe not aware that it's having an effect on what's happening at a cellular level inside your body, okay? Protein intake. I figured we may as well start with the most, the most obvious or the, the most looked at element of recovery. And I said, we'd start off with a bang, the anabolic window. So you've heard it that you have to have X amount of protein in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. That's a myth, okay? Muscle protein synthesis, it's kind of, uh, it, it's not very quick to react, okay? You will go through periods where your muscle protein synthesis rates are high, low, high, low, somewhere in between depending on what your eating patterns are like. It doesn't just do an absolute nosedive when you exercise and you have a kind of storage pool of circulating amino acids that you're not going to deplete for the most part in a training session or a race unless it's multiple hours in duration. So that anabolic window is not important, okay? However, consuming a little bit of protein with your carbohydrates can speed up glycogen repletion. So it's one plus for something like chocolate milk or just milk itself, which has superior hydration. Um, I guess um, elements to it, it can be better than some isotonic sports drinks, which is interesting. But the, the main thing to take from, from this slide here is that if you're looking at protein intake and trying to optimize the response you get from training, how much lean mass you keep, how strong you get, how much muscle you build over the space of a season, a year, two years, it's your overall protein intake should be approximately 1.6 grams per kg per day. That's where you maximize muscle protein synthesis. And if you want to peel that back one layer further, yeah, I want you to think of the numbers 10 and three. So you need to get 10 grams of essential amino acids every three hours or so that you're awake to optimize again that muscle protein synthesis. And you want to get them from high biological value sources, okay? So what, what does all that mean? So if you're an athlete and you're looking to improve, you want to keep the muscle you have, you maybe want to gain a little bit more, you want to build a little bit on the strength base you have and maybe prevent yourself from getting injured. Protein does have a role to play there. And even at certain phases of a menstrual cycle for a female athlete, obviously, if you're not at this number, you're at an increased risk of getting an injury, which is interesting. So on, on a day-to-day -day basis, basically you need to include a high biological value protein source at every meal. If you live in a westernized country, which you likely do if you're watching today or will be watching this on YouTube in the future, that just basically means including some egg, some dairy, some meat, some fish, some whey, protein bars, a snack, something like that at every meal. Or if you're plant-based, to get that 10 grams of essential amino acids, you probably need to be having a soya-based product or, or a soya derivative product like tofu or tempa, something like that, or getting your complementary proteins in peas and corn, rice and beans, uh, pasta and certain legumes or veggies. Um, and that, that's, that's really all you need to do. The following slide, I, I wanted to maybe give you a bit of a visual as to what it might look like. So, you know, if you're anything like me, 
breakfast and dinner are the two biggest meals of the day. I'm pretty busy during the day, so I don't get to eat that much. And what I wanted to outline here was muscle protein synthetic responses in relation to a meal. So if you, if you eat a meal that's high in protein, so my breakfast would always often be porridge with a scoop of whey protein in it. You're going to have a high rate of muscle protein synthesis. If I don't eat for a number of hours, it's going to drop. I might have a little snack here, a bit of a typo there, and it's going to go up again, down again, up again if I have a huge dinner. So my, my dinner would typically be a large piece of meat. I'm going to have some beans or legumes there. It's going to be about 40, 50 grams of protein. So I get a huge muscle protein synthetic response from that. So that, that's, that's what we mean when we're looking about optimizing muscle protein synthesis. You want it to be as high as often as possible. So for example, if I ate nothing in between breakfast and dinner, it would be high here, flatlined and high again. So that net level is slightly less, if that makes sense. Hope it does. Guys, if you can just mute your microphones, please. That would be that would be great if someone there with an unused microphone. Just make sure you're muted just until the QA section. Okay. Next thing I want us to look at is vitamin D. And I have this here just for the time of the year. It is some research says that uh, vitamin D has a huge role to play in your likelihood of getting a connective tissue injury or an upper respiratory tract infection. And it's interesting that, uh, that it has that role to play because vitamin D is also shown to be a player to a certain degree in modulating your body's immune system response to exercise. So vitamin D status and how quickly you recover and how effectively you recover from exercise and induced muscle damage has been shown time and time again. So basically what you need to know, if you live in the Northern hemisphere and you exercise a lot to make sure you recover as you would hope to, to minimize your risk of a connective tissue injury. So cartilage damage, ligament tears, meniscus tears, muscle tears, all that bad stuff and upper respiratory tract infections, you either need to be having the likes of salmon or mackerel fillets, maybe tuna two or three times a week, you need to be having some fortified milk. So whether that's soya milk or regular dairy milk, those are going to be your two main sources of dietary vitamin D. And you want to probably be taking a vitamin D and K2 supplement on a, on a daily basis, particularly between the months of October and March when the UV index is not high and we don't get that much sun time or sunlight exposure anyways, particularly in Ireland, the UK and anywhere north of us. So that's, that's really the deal. For some athletes, it's suggested to have up to 2,000 IU a day. If you're deficient, you might even want to go higher, but that's kind of under the supervision of a GP or a dietitian. So that, that's vitamin D, that's protein. What we're going to look at next is glycogen repletion. So glycogen is the word used for this carbohydrate storage that's inside your body so glycogen is something i talk about an awful lot with any of the endurance type athletes i work with make sure your glycogen doesn't dip exercise requires carbohydrate intake to make sure your glycogen levels don't bonk low glycogen levels would mean x y and z they're sick of me talking about glycogen so why am i talking about it here just to maybe peel back a little bit your glycogen levels are going to really determine how you perform in a session. So let, let me put it like this. The higher the intensity you're exercising or racing at, the more you're using carbohydrates or glycogen as a fuel source, okay? The lower your levels of glycogen are, depend, depending on, um, on your dietary approaches, but independent of how hard you're working, so you'll often hear people talking about, I'm doing fat fuel zones. It's irrelevant. If your glycogen levels start to dip, irrespective of how hard you're working, it starts to feel harder. You start to make lactate at earlier time points. You are most likely going to have a drop in central drive. So you, your brain will, will kind of uh, limit the output you're capable of doing. And interestingly enough, 
when you deplete your glycogen levels in an exercise bout, your recovery is extended, okay? Particularly if you don't recover properly. So what they've seen is a day later, athletes who depleted their glycogen don't fill that tank up again properly. Training still feels harder the next day. They're still not fully recovered. The, the session doesn't go as well as it could or should. And the real interesting thing, when your glycogen levels are low, your immune system is suppressed and that should perk your ears up a little bit. If you haven't tweaked it by now, your immune system is what does the bulk of your recovery. Okay. So think low glycogen, immunosuppression, poor recovery. That means poor muscle remodeling. That means longer recovery times. That means increased likelihood of being sick or injured or running into that overtraining um kind of territory and it's also why vitamin d does have a role to play in recovery because vitamin d and white blood cell counts are very closely correlated so glycogen repletion how do we fill our glycogen tank back we do it in a biphasic manner so again clients will hear me talk about high gi carbohydrates as soon as possible after an exercise session and that's because if you can get half a gram per kg of high GI carbs, and I'll put that into layman's terms in a second, within 30 minutes after your workout, your pro-glycogen tank will fill up very, very quickly. Okay. So pro-glycogen is the, it's the part of your glycogen that's very responsive. So if you have something like a banana or some orange juice or maltodextrin powder, or like a high five energy right after your session or race, that part of your glycogen tank fills up and it fills up very, very quickly. So your recovery is enhanced. It's ameliorated. You're kind of expediting the process. For me, I hover somewhere between 75 and 80 kilos, depending on time of year, exercise load, how much spare time I have, to be perfectly honest. And um, what I need to get is somewhere between a 35, 40 gram dose of carbohydrates of that high GI or rapidly absorbable nature so my my go-to would often be some chocolate milk so muju chocolate milk and maybe a banana simple as that's all you need to do for all the fancy science it can boil down to something just like that and if you want to go for bonus points the four hours after your session you want to be getting about a gram per kg per hour in that recovery window afterwards now you don't need to do this for like a gym session or a 30 minute easy run this would be like for a weekend long ride or a big brick session or anything high intensity two hours plus or a race this would be gross overkill for exercise less than an hour in duration and easy so clients kind of who aren't doing that kind of workload won't have heard me talk about this but take it that if you're training for an ironman triathlon you probably will want to pay attention to this so again one gram per kg per hour for an 80 kilo man we'll say that would be the likes of a bagel with jam on it that would be that 500 ml bottle of muji with the banana that would be two baked potatoes that would be a bag of microwave rice and um, it would be a pack of those fresh egg noodles maybe with some uh, sweet chili sauce on top of it all of those things give you approximately 80 grams of carbohydrates just off the top of my head so if there's if there's one thing i do try and get clients to get into their heads it's to make your recovery as effective as possible and i consider carbs to be the most important thing when we're when we're talking about recovery getting your carbs in before during and after training is going to make that much much easier you're going to have a much better time much more effective recovery if you can do that Okay, so that is glycogen. What are we going to look at next? Fluids. So fluid replacement, again, is something people don't really pay attention to. Lots of the time people will drink to thirst. And that's okay if you've done an easy session or you've done a gym session or you, you haven't done enough to build up kind of a sizable fluid deficit. But it has been shown that drinking ad libitum, so as you feel, it doesn't necessarily rehydrate you as you might think. You don't necessarily always drink enough if you drink the thirst. Just to mention, it's not in the slides, but if you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. Thirst and darker urine are how people typically monitor hydration status. 
those are delayed hydration markers. So when you've already hit the one or 2% dehydration range, your body starts releasing vasopressin and angiotensin, and that stimulates thirst, or that makes your kidneys reabsorb water, making your urine darker. So you're, you're kind of playing catch up there. And even if you wanted to be pedantic about it, being dehydrated does take a few days to recover from itself. 1% dehydration can knock your performance by about 10% for up to three days. So that's really important. So when we're looking at fluids, here's a couple of numbers. Your baseline intake is 35 mils per kg per day. So for me, that would be 2.8 liters on a day I don't exercise, okay? Fluid replacement then will be weight loss or, or sweat loss during exercise multiplied by 1.25 to 1.5, okay? So that, that's kind of that discretionary range there. And how do you figure out weight loss during exercise? So any, any clients will know because they'll have done a sweat test for me. And it's exactly what you think it is. If, if you're not aware, you weigh yourself right before, right after a session, and you, you take some precautions to, to make that as accurate as possible. So you don't drink or eat anything between your weigh-ins. You don't use the toilet between your weigh-ins. You put the scales in the same place. You towel off after your workout. You weigh in in minimal clothing. And you try and get a liter or mils per hour of sweat loss. If you can do that, you can kind of gauge every time you exercise how much you should be drinking within the three hours, okay? So this is within three hours after your training session. And that, that's really all there is to it, okay? <clears throat> and it's important to note, if you want to rehydrate effectively, drinking just water isn't the best way to do that. So adding some sodium into that or lots of sodium in some cases and some carbohydrates, that's going to increase the rate of fluid uptake. So you've got many different ways that water can get into your body. You absorb it through the lining of your stomach, or you can absorb it actively in your intestines through uh, GLUT5 and SGLT transporters where you take in carbohydrates and sodium anyway, which, which is why sports drinks are formulated as such. They result in better hydration compared to water alone. And as I had mentioned already, milk can rehydrate better than water and some sports drinks. So if you wanted to kind of get a three for one and nail your recovery, the likes of a chocolate milk really is that good. And if you drink 500 ml or 250 ml, you can factor that into your fluid replacement equation and just get the rest from some water mixed with some juice or squash and an electrolyte tablet or a pinch of salt, kind of whatever suits you. But that's really the 411 on fluid replacement. Sometimes if it's really, really hot, you will need to do things before exercise to curtail how much fluid you lose. That's kind of outside the scope for today, but what I'm talking about there will be pre-cooling tactics, will be hyperhydration tactics. Any, any client doing an Ironman or an ultra run will have done that with me, or you, know, you will do that with me in the future. Um, but for recovery purposes, this is really what you need to be paying attention to. And just, just to reiterate, carbohydrate solutions of 6 to 10%. A Lucozade sport is about 6%. If you make the likes of a high five energy up in a 500 ml bottle, it'll give you around 10%, just for reference. Okay, so here's an interesting one. Omega-3s, essential fatty acids. Uh, you cannot make them in your body, which is why they're essential. Omega-3s have a humongous anti-inflammatory effect, okay? And it's well known that they can do things like reduce soreness, stiffness, inflammation. You hear them anecdotally recommended for everything under the sun. And this is where we need to stop and think performance or adaptation. If you're training for adaptation, you probably don't want to take omega-3s before or in the period after your workout because that anti-inflammatory effect might dampen the stimulus you get from your workout. So if it's off season, you should still take omega-3s because they're still correlated with a lower rate of LDL cholesterol, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, even cognitive decline. You're just looking at taking it maybe before bed or at the opposite end of the day to when you train, just so it doesn't 
have an acute impact on the stimulus you get from your training session. I hope that makes sense. And on any given day, if you're to supplement with it, you're looking to get a minimum of 600 milligrams of EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid. That's the big player here. You'll find that in, I know, bulk powders, their omega-3 supplement is really, really strong. If you take two of those a day, you'll hit that. Some other brands, then you can get high strength EPA, omega-3 fatty acids, and that'll do the job. Just pay attention to the label. This is what you're looking for. That can reduce recovery time. It can reduce the side effects of, of training. Or if you've had a big race or you're a cyclist and you're doing multi-day events, high dose omega-3s can just help you get through just that little bit easier. So that's really all there is to that there. And you know, when when I say omega-3s, what I need you to think of is tuna, mackerel, salmon, omega-3 enriched eggs. And then cod liver oil, fish oil, krill oil, all of those things. That's what we mean when we say omega-3s. So yes, if your goal is performance, no, if you're training for adaptation, like in the winter months, this would be a bad idea right after training. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So, and keep keeping in line with our performance or adaptation segment here, I want to go through tart cherry juice and this, the same recommendations for tart, tart cherry juice apply to vitamins E and C, both of which have massive antioxidant capabilities. Okay, so we'll start with cherry juice. It has a huge antioxidant load. So cherries themselves, very antioxidant rich. If you make a concentrated juice out of them, you'll see in Monster Rugby, for example, one of the protocols it used to have for an injured player was tart cherry juice, little cap, once, twice a day, just to help with the recovery process. What the research has shown is that eight to 12 fluid ounces consumed twice a day for four to seven days can be really, really useful in reducing recovery rates. So this is interesting for anybody who has an event coming up where you maybe have heat, semifinals, finals, multi-day events, uh, anything like that, or just something of an extended duration you might want to start taking this up to a week before your event and it can just help with your recovery. Again, if you were to do this all year round or take tart cherry juice after a training session, a long ride, you're severely compromising the inflammation, the oxidative stress that happens at a muscular level and you're taking away from the, I suppose, the adaptive responses you get in return. The same applies for vitamins E and C. So, God, I used to do it myself, thinking that it would stop me from ever getting sick. I would take those high dose omega or not omega C or not omega threes, vitamin C and zinc effervescent could have a thousand to twelve hundred percent of your daily vitamin C, and I would go training. That's all well and good. However, because it has such a high antioxidant capacity, if you were to zoom in at a cellular level, all the lactic acid, all the oxidative stress that's happening. The vitamin C is counteracting that. The best way I can describe this is having these omega-3s, tart cherry juices, high dose vitamin E and C around training. It's like cycling with stabilizers or with one of those little bikes that has an engine in it. You're spending time doing your training. You're just not really getting anything from it. You're not better for it. I hope that makes sense as an analogy. And interestingly enough, this is more true for endurance type athletes and is for power or strength athletes. So there, there are differences in terms of the physiological adaptations that you're, you're kind of sparking off there. So that's, that's something to note. If, the, if you're doing gym work or plyometrics, this might not be as important as it would be for the likes of a long run or a long cycle or a brick session, something like that. Just, uh, just FYI. Okay, and next on our list then, and this is kind of a ever recommended supplement for anyone I work with, creatine monohydrate. It's often only thought about in the context of building muscle, getting lean, sprinters, long jumpers, weightlifters. Not many people might have considered it as helpful for recovery. However, it is because it decreases membrane permeability and increases satellite cell activity. So what, um, what does that mean? 
if it can decrease membrane permeability, what that means at a cellular level, things can flow in and out of a damaged cell easier, i.e. fuel, white blood cells, things like that, proteins, amino acids, the recovery process is just literally not hitting the same amount of roadblocks. And satellite cells are what stimulate or signal for muscle protein synthesis. The more satellite cells you have, the more of an anabolic response you're going to have to the work you're doing. So creating monohydrate can help in that respect. And not only is it useful for helping you maintain the lean mass you have, helping you get more from you know, any type of gym work you're doing, any high gear efforts you would do on the bike, hill sprints, anything like that, it helps your immune system. It also can increase your glycogen tank. But if you take it for 12 weeks at a, the lower dose of six grams daily, you're looking at reducing muscle pain on, on race days afterwards. And you're looking at if you throw in a loading phase, it reduces the level of muscle damage you get from an exhaustive session and all out effort. So you're, you're again, your you're kind of expected recovery is going to be lesser again. And the extent of the pain you experience will not be the same. So all, all of these things, effectively what they're doing, number one, you recover quicker, you experience less pain. You don't have the same amount of damage happening either in your muscles or your cells, arteries, vascular structures. And um, your life is just a little bit easier because you're not limping all the time or you're not constantly in, in this phase of just about recovering, then going training again, then going back to square one. Is that it makes a humongous difference. This, this is one of the elements in how nutrition can change the, change the game for an athlete. Recovery is really, really important. I, I didn't really have it in the scope of this talk to go through all of the metabolic and physiological responses of recovery, but it's huge. If you can do these things, you, you'll recover much, much better. You'll feel it. You'll progress at a better rate. You'll get sick and injured much, much less, and your training performance will just go through the roof. In turn, then racing and I suppose your, your, your key competitions of the year, they'll just more likely go better if you pay attention to these things. So that's, that's really about it. For any of the non-clients who are attending or watching on YouTube, if you are looking to come and work with me, please do get in touch. I'm easy to find on Instagram or my website at avonlynchfitnot.com. But for now, do we have any questions on the topic? I'll hang around for a minute or two. If there's any questions, we can, uh, we can go through them together. Otherwise, I'll knock it on the head. And you can send me your questions or DM me or email me. Okay. Just pop them in the chat box there. But if we don't have any, I am going to call it a night. And thank you guys for logging in. As I said, I will be putting this up on YouTube, which takes a while to upload. So you can expect that there in the next day or two. And I might do a podcast. Uh, if you haven't listened to it yet, Fuel Better podcast on Spotify. I might do a podcast on the topic of recovery where I'll maybe go into a little bit of a deeper dive, maybe in longer format on this topic. And if you have any other topics you'd like to see, please just let me know. Okay, we got no questions. I'll take it that that means I covered it nicely. Um, so yeah, guys, I'm going to stop it there. Have a great evening. Any clients I'm talking to, Please check in with me in the next 24, 48 hours. And as per usual, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Any non-clients looking to get in touch with me, please do. We can chat, see what we can do for you. Okay, guys, have a good one.